Welcome to America's Heroes Group. This is America's Heroes Group, our roundtable of mental health matters with our partner, Nami Contra Costa. Today is Saturday, March 4th, 2023. March is Women History Month. Our host is Cliff Kelly. I'm Sean Clayman, the co-host. Our executive producer is Glenda Smith. And our digital media producer is Ivan Ortega of Scout Turner Productions. And also Kaya is our audio engineer today. Our partner, Gigi Crowder, is in the line. She's the executive director of NAMI Contra Costa in California. NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness, an advocacy group founded by family members of people with mental illness. And she brought us a panelist today. That's Dr. Carrie Frazier. She is the president and CEO of, of Village Keepers. And we're going to talk about mental health of women. That's so important. We're going to talk about that. Gigi, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back. Our pleasure. And Dr. Kerry Frazier, how are you doing today? Just fine. Thank you. So tell us, lead us off. Um, tell us about what's going on in mental health for women. I know there's a lot of things that we need to kind of go into and discuss about this issue. I know that mental health is important for women, that women suffer for it, suffer with it more often than men, according to what the studies show. We'll get into those numbers in a little bit. But tell us about Village Keepers, Dr. Frazier, and also tell us about what the social work around that is bringing to the table today. Well, Village Keepers is an umbrella organization that really takes a holistic look at the, at the family. Often the focus is on children, and what we try to do is not only focus on children, but the whole family and the family system, internally as well as externally, to see how what the impact is and what services are needed to help to stabilize families and keep them strong. Okay, so tell us about how serious is the issue around uh, mental health, particularly with women? Because I think we don't pay enough attention to mental health, but how is it unique to women? I think it's unique to women, in particular the way women are uh, reared in our culture. Uh, There's an assumption that somehow women are able to cope better, able to deal better with stress, can handle more. And in particular, in our African-American community, the myth of the strong black woman that is, is supposed to be able to stand up under whatever hardships and still bounce back and keep the family together. That is what I consider one of the major myths that causes mental illness with people not wanting to admit that they can't handle all the things that are thrown at them. Now, Gigi, what can you add to that to let us know more about, kind of add some color to some of the things that women deal with every day and also how much attention do we pay or not pay enough attention to the uh, the issues around mental health for women? Well, uh, NAMI actually was started by two women. And when we have our groups, it's typically women who show up who are actually experiencing some symptoms based on the fact that they have children who live with mental health challenges. And then they themselves take on some of the woes, as Dr. Frazier mentioned that actually sometimes I'm more worried about the mom who calls over a period of time when she's not able to get the support for her loved one. And I'm of the belief, I know what the statistics bear, but I'm of the belief that just as many men, because in our mental health day-to-day care, we see more males getting uh, diagnosed with the severe mental illnesses. And it's in alignment with the myth that they're, that the women can handle it more, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we're really doing a lot of work at NAMI Contra Costa because we'll have all these women on the board, and then when we elect the president, it's always a male, right? Mm -hmm. So we're looking at the balance that needs to take place in order for us to see that it equally impacts males and females and that the, the, the medications need to be tailored to meet the needs of women. Too often the the medications, because more men get treated for severe mental illness and get the harsher uh, diagnosis and the uh, medication regimen is much more severe, women often go off of their meds because of the symptoms associated with it. And as Dr. Frazier said, this does vary by ethnic community. Men are much more often incarcerated for living with the mental illness, but women are much more neglected. And then we start thinking about the current um, just released CDC report about young girls and their mental health. That's going to follow them. So we know we just got a release report from the CDC that is alarming around the stress that young girls are facing. And then, of course, when you look at 
any report that's across the board, you start looking at ethnic and cultural groups, and you know that they're gonna their their numbers are gonna be much worse than the general population. So we're paying attention to it throughout uh, NAMI with particular support groups designed just for women. So I have some numbers here from the Turnbridge. They're a mental health substance abuse disorder treatment program in Connecticut, and they specialize in women's health issues and also with mental health. They say that women are more vulnerable. This is also off of their website. I'm reading this from their website uh, and cutting some things out a little bit to make it for time. Women are vulnerable to certain mental health disorders and men. Estimated about 7% of women were affected by a serious mental illness in 2020 compared with 4% of, of men in the U.S. when considering any other and all illnesses, including those that have not caused serious functional impairment. 26% of women struggled with any mental illness in 2020 versus 16% of men. This pattern holds true for adolescents as well. The lifetime prevalence of mental illness disorders was higher among females, 51%, the males, 41, 48%. So we see that there is, there is, the numbers to me don't look that dramatic other, but there's other than a couple of points in that study or that in their data that they show. However, we want to talk about what are some of the things that we need to do to address and take care of and, and ameliorate the problem of mental health not being addressed in, in, among women and, women, in, in, with women across the country in general. So, Doctor, what can you tell us about that, and how do we solve this problem? My opinion is building in family support. We typically uh, focus in, as I mentioned earlier, on the child, not understanding or paying attention to the fact that the child has to go home, and there has to be adults there to support them. And so we can't just focus on the child. We have to focus on the whole unit, the environment that the child is going into. In particular, in village keepers, we're sensitive to single mothers because we know that no matter how strong the mother is or even her income, just the stress of being of trying to manage children when they're really it really should be a two parent responsibility is going to cause stress. So support for parents and families is really critical. Um, sometimes, you know, the only time people get services is if they get involved in this in the uh, welfare system. What I'm hoping is that we can anticipate some of the needs and begin to talk to people that are a part of the support groups that uh, Ms. Crowder mentioned and get a sense of what their needs are and then design services around the, the needs that they identify. So, Gigi, do you feel that women aren't seeking the help for mental, uh, mental health as much or take mental health seriously as they should? No, I think we have a just as much taboo and, and bias against getting support from women as we do from men. And your statistics that you spoke of earlier don't highlight the fact that men actually have a higher suicide rate mm -hmm. than women do and always have. And so what I think is that men don't seek out the services until it's extreme. So the data that we're collecting and that keeps getting reported is that women are more prevalent. But it's, it's, it's based on how you're collecting the data. And so for me, us having a particular focus on women now, we've seen that men follow women into services. Once the woman gets her basic needs met, she's more able to clearly define what's going on in the family unit. And that's why we're all taking this more holistic approach, because we recognize you have the identified person, but then there's residuals for the impacted family. So if a kid has uh, challenges, usually you can follow the pattern and know that from some point there's been a parent that has not been able to meet the child's need. Not saying that we, we, we have totally moved away from blaming the mother for why a kid has mental illness, but there is a strong genetic link and often it comes from, you know, a biological parent having had the mental health challenge. Moms are much more nurturers, and so they tend to seek out the supports more, especially if they have a child that's struggling. And so uh, paying attention to the whole family unit is important, but making sure that the mom is not having more challenges because of her keeping that strong, you know, face around not acknowledging what's going on with her is, is important as well. Always in my mind, because because women oftentimes have to take care and raise a family, 
uh, in, their, in this country and around the world, we're seeing more and more often that women are becoming single mothers during the, the father is not there or not present in the household, particularly with people of color. Do you see that as adding to, as you alluded to, Doctor, the, some of the stress that women face because you have to balance bringing the bread, being the breadwinner as well as being the, the mother, being the counselor, being the, the, the everything to everybody in the household, and then on top of that, trying to be yourself. Does that does that yeah. add to the stress of, of what we're talking about? But then, how does a, this, if you're doing that every single day, do women do you have an, a, a, as a woman do you feel like people have the time to stop and take a breath and say, wait a minute, what about my mental health? Well, I think you define the problem just really succinctly. Having to cope with all of those things or be vigilant, not knowing when the next crisis is going to come, will wear anyone down. And that's when I talk about the fact that we have, for instance, a single parents program where we anticipate, given how, the way our society is and given the way our culture has evolved in terms of the African-American community, not having the supports from the males, is we anticipate that there's going to be a time, for instance, during the month or, or the next couple of months that maybe there won't be enough food. Mm-hmm. There may be a time when the car breaks down. Uh, there may be a time when there's a behavior problem at school and, and mom can't get there because she's working out of the city. Looking through that lens and identifying parents who are willing to work with us, we can put services in place that can stand in the gap when those unforeseen things come, as well as give her support ongoing, because she's, number one, opted to stay with the family, and she is trying to to fill all those roles for nurturing and training and teaching that children need. So do you feel that women, Doctor, do you feel that women are... Are, are getting the right resources or, or trying to look out for the look out for the right resources to help themselves and help them cope with this do we because when you think about it when you go through your daily everyday routine you don't always think about oh i should take some time out we were we are more likely to go to the gym and work out and exercise to look better or to go to the spa and get some treatment because it feels good but you know i mean i think about what we're what were our emotions what we're thinking as 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 a, as, as a mental aspect well, and see, I think that that's, again, you're defining the problem. And it's that's absolutely all of the above. And even though a woman may think about it, finding the time to carve out, to take that me time and to do the self-nurturing is, is, is the, the major challenge. Who's going to watch the kids when I go to the gym? You know, uh, who's going to be there if I decide I want to take a, a mental health day off? Those are things that I believe women think about. And they talk about it, but in terms of actually putting it into practice, the circumstances of daily living can just wreck all of that and make it not be possible. And maybe not until if you plan to do it this month, it may not happen for two months. And in the process, there have been other occurrences that make things even worse. So I think people think about it. I think they talk about it. But in terms of being able to make it happen, that's where the disconnect can easily come. So, Jeju, what's the solution? What What should women be doing right now? I think it's an educational piece. I know that through COVID, we lifted up our support groups and we made sure that we were working with the faith communities because that's where a lot of the women tended to go and prioritize their self-care. It was through their connection with their faith. So when we started having our support groups and educating people about, you know, we all, we've all heard of the, putting the oxygen mask on yourself first, then people started realizing, moms and women started realizing, oh, by prioritizing myself, I am being the best person for my husband and my children. Yes. That I'm going to be resentful <laughs> if I don't, but they have to be taught that. They, they don't see it automatically because we don't talk about it enough. And we have a society that places women often in second, in second place. Their needs come, you know, we judge them when they decide, I'm going to go to the gym or I'm going to take some time for me. And, 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 and so often them understanding that taking time for them means I'm showing and demonstrating to my family. In order for me to be fully there for you, I must first take care of me. So, Gigi, on that same mm-hmm. note, so, if, so women are listening right now across the country, around the world, 
what would you tell them that they may not they don't have necessarily the time to go to the gym or go to uh, therapy or go to treatment may not have the resources to do that what can they do tonight you know something a simple tip or something some kind of behaviors or things they can do they, where they can carve out something in that at home maybe before they go to bed maybe they first wake up in the morning you know going to church on sunday i think is definitely a positive thing that would help a lot of people out but what else can mm-hmm. they do in the, in the household well, you know what I'm doing right now because I can, because this is a radio show and I have a lot of things going on. I often get on the phone with my like-minded sister friend and I'm cleaning while I'm on the telephone. We have cell phones now. We're not trapped to a landline where we can't <laughs> move around. And for me, I know that some of my friends rely heavily on the opportunity to connect through phone calls and just sharing, having a safe place. Another thing we need to do um, is the deep breathing and meditation. So I ask individuals who can't make it to the gym, just 10 minutes prior to starting your day, take that time to think about what you want to see accomplished, but do some deep breathing. And I I just did the workshop we talked last month with Reverend um, Wanda Johnson, and so she had the women come up, all the mothers who lost their loved ones to to um, gun violence at the hands of law enforcement, and I did a whole segment on decluttering, and so mentally, spiritually, and physically decluttering your space, whether it's what you see when you wake up in the morning or what you have that you're carrying in your mind. That's really important to have some clarity around what you want to do for the day. So that 10 minutes, I've already started getting feedback from some of the mothers and some of the women who attended, moms and women from across the country from various uh, ethnic and cultural backgrounds who had that unfortunate tragedy. And I was like, thanks so much. You know, I'm breathing. I'm going deep. You know, I'm I'm, I'm not in that uh, flight or fright stage, so I'm able to really be more intentional, and I'm more at peace. Mm. And I said, that's all I can give to those moms who've had such a tragedy in their life, that they should be breathing deeply and physically looking at the space they're in and removing some of the stuff that causes them to be more anxious and depressed than I achieved what I wanted to last weekend. So, Dr. Mm-hmm. Fraser, now one of the things that the, that uh, your organization is trying to accomplish is trying to get vans, health vans, to, in order to move into communities and offer screening and things like that. Tell us about that and how is that progressing? Well, it's we're really pleased to say it's progressing well. We on on a weekly basis we go out into the community and we provide blood pressure screening, pulse, temperature, all the signs that are not invasive but really key to giving the patients an idea of what's going on in their bodies. And so what we found with that is that many times people may have a regular doctor, but they don't go for months because the appointments are sometimes hard to get. So being able to check in on a weekly basis or biweekly basis so that they can feel comfortable that they're doing the right things and they're on track has really been helpful. Um, And that being said, for people who blood pressures and uh, blood sugars and things like that are too high. We can give them feedback and advice as to what they might be able to do to modify diet, uh, stresses, and anything that's going on in their environment that's causing that to give them tools and and information about how to modify that so things get back on track. And and how can people reach out and connect with Village Keepers? In in the California Contra Costa area, how do they connect to you? um, We have a website. Uh, it's www.villagekeeper.com, and we also have a phone number, and that's area 925-787-4827. Thanks for that. And then tell us more about what your future, what the future holds for Village Keepers and also this initiative to try to bring, I like the idea of bringing health screenings and, and also bringing some of the care to the client as opposed to the person having to go out and seek these things out. When they don't, like we just talked about, right. when life is 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 got going on. Well, our future is that we we find that going where the, the the clients are is the best way, and so we've given up the whole concept of trying to get people to come to a particular office, and so we're seeking a mobile van so that we can go into the neighborhoods on particular days of the week and be right there where the people are. 
The other thing that we're doing at Village Keepers is we're developing a network of service providers that focus in particular on the African-American community so that there's a roadmap. Many times people don't access services because they have had past experiences that have been negative and they don't they didn't get the treatment that they thought they should have. And so they hesitate about going and may wait till things get too far gone before they get some help. So we, we're working on developing a group of network of providers in our network that we can actually do a warm handoff, that they know us, and when we make a referral for a client, they have someone to be able to ask for by name that's going to take care of them and, and be sensitive to their needs. The other thing that we're working with is for organizations that say they're working with the African-American community, we want to be able to talk to them and, and find out what is their cultural competence. It's more than a checklist, you know, and it's more than one uh, hour of in-service training. We want to find out what is their sensitivity to the culture and what can they do to make the environments more welcoming and so that people will access the services that are there. And do you feel like you're making an impact? What can you tell us about some success stories? Yes, I think I think we've made we're making an impact. In particular, with the uh, health screenings, we've had at least four life saving um, assessments since October. Wow! And and so we're we're excited because you know sometimes when you have an idea, you don't really know if it's going to be as good as you think. So for my on behalf of my nurses and myself, we're gratified that we are able to do some good. We can see the fruit of our labor, and looking forward to continuing to serve the community. So, Gigi. With the, um, network, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. No, so with the network, we have at least six organizations that are nonprofits that are, are geared for services that are a part of our network. So beginning with that, we want to keep building on it, and we're looking for allies as well, and that's beginning to come together. So, Gigi, tell us and give us your final thoughts about the state of women's health care right now in general, but also particularly when it comes to mental health? Well, we're finally paying attention to it. For a long time, we didn't carve out that space to talk about women's mental health. And so even a program like today where we're doing it highlights the attention we need. And so not just NAMI, but other organizations have started, you know, being more intentional of carving it out and recognizing the particular focus that we should have on uh, women and in most cases the women that are most harmed who have the um, social determinant factors that suggest that if we don't get them help there won't be great outcomes now there's actually federal funding specific to women and uh, we have some local funding and more attention at local levels about how do we carve out the space to ensure that young women are not fallen victim to the heart disease, the high blood pressure, breast cancer, and all of the things that highlight the, uh, the um, health disparities, especially as it relates to mental health. More people show up in hospital settings with the underlying cause being a mental health challenge that has not been addressed than they show up with any physical ailments in the emergency room. So. The attention is there now. That had not been before. We're really excited about being a part of it and partnering with people like Dr. Frazier, who has been ahead of the game and making the connection between the physical, the mental, and I'll say in her case, and the spiritual. Mm -hmm. Really important. Mm -hmm. And what you mentioned is so critical. Like I said, I'm glad we're bringing attention to this, this topic. It reminds me of what's going on here in Chicago, actually. We have an election going on for the mayoral race. And mm -hmm. some of the candidates are actually bringing up the fact that we use our police officers as mental health specialists. We send, we want to send a person with a gun to a house when there's a mental health issue as opposed to sending someone who's trained like a social worker to take care of that situation. And mm -hmm. I think it's really, right. Yeah, and I think that's something to really, really need to really focus on. And I, I think the tide is turning where people are now getting, getting to understand that mental health is such a critical part of your overall health. Exactly. And, you know, in California, we now have the Miles Hall Lifeline Act because we looked at that after the unfortunate killing of him. And so our 988 national number is actually named after Miles Hall here in California. So that was our big list the last two years. And we got introduced to you all through that effort. So we appreciate the platform. 
Gigi Crowder, executive director of NAMI Contra Costa in California. NAMI is a national alliance of mental illness and advocacy group founded by family members of people with mental illness. And our great panelist, Dr. Kerry Frazier, she's the president and CEO of Village Keepers. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Our pleasure. So thanks to our technical producer, Ivan, our audio engineer, uh, Shakaya. Our stand-in producer today is Justin. He did a great job with that. We had some technical difficulties here at WVN today, but we got to underst- understand this is radio. That's what we do for a living. <laughs> it happens, man. But we got it under control, which is a different atmosphere for us. But we pushed through at the, and persevered, and that's what we do at America's Heroes Group. And that's what we do all the time. We'll be back next week. I want to thank a couple of th- people we had on our show today. Thanks for RHF. Thanks for Kaya. Thanks for Justin. Thanks for Ivan. And also make sure you go to americashg.org, americashg.org. That is where our website is, and that's where you can get information about all the things we're doing and leave us feedback. You want to reach out to us by phone. That's 312-803-2618. Check out our archive on YouTube. Plenty of videos out there. Make sure you like and subscribe and also share your thoughts. so We can get to you the information, resources, and referrals that you deserve as a veteran community and all the people that we care about that serve this country. This is America's Heroes Group. God bless. We'll be back next week.